You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, presented by Veteran Strategies, a local public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza at Union Station, Grand Hall and Conference Center, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We are here today with the man who runs Lumina. And you may not have heard of Lumina, but after this conversation, you're going to understand exactly how much Lumina is changing people's lives. Jamie Marisotis, thank you. Thanks, Robert. Great to be with you. Talk a little bit about the Lumina Foundation and your role as CEO and how you got to this place in Indianapolis. So let's start with the foundation. So Lumina is an unusual entity. We're one of the nation's largest private foundations. Um, We are focused exclusively on one issue, which is making learning opportunities possible for all post high school. So that, that's our, that's our mission. Uh, in the sphere of large foundations nationally, we're probably in the top 50 or 75 in terms of assets. So it puts us in this unusual position of actually being an organization that can use its resources not only to make grants to support change, but also be a leadership organization, to be an organization that can actually uh, influence others and hopefully make a difference. When you when you have as much money as Lumina Foundation does, we have a, an asset base in excess of a billion dollars, it puts you in an unusual position of being able to uh, have some influence. My view is that it also means that you have a responsibility, and that responsibility is a responsibility to lead, and to lead so with the highest degree of effectiveness and efficiency you can possibly find. So uh, our work at the foundation is very much aimed towards this idea that we want to be a leadership organization, and we want to focus on being as, as productive and as successful as possible. Much has been made, and I want to talk a little bit about more about you especially, but stay on Lumina for just one second. For decades, post-World War II, especially post-World War II industrial age, college, 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 college. You have to go to college. You have to get a four-year degree. That was the mantra we read about and, quite frankly, uh, were told as as kids, as students. I graduated uh, from Howe High School in IPS in 1986. Right. Realized that I did not have the skill base to do anything except really – read, write, and communicate. Um, I went in the military. I went in the army as a way to afford college. But for so many people, so many students in the new economy, it was go to college or (laughs) as Judge Smales famously said in Caddyshack, the world needs ditch diggers too. Right, right. So there was that dichotomy. How do you push back against that message of four-year college or nothing? Right. Yeah, it really is a false dichotomy. So let, let's start there. That um, I think, you know, we we should live and and endeavor to live in a fact based world. So some basic facts are probably useful. One basic fact that I don't think is very controversial is that there's a rising demand for talent in society today. In other words, the world today is more complicated than it was a decade ago, two decades ago, three decades ago, four decades ago. So that complexity means that people need to be better prepared both for work and for life in this increasingly complex world. That preparation, though, means that you've got to be prepared for a wide array of things, and different people play different societal roles, again, in work and in society as contributors to to society. So um, when you say uh, college or ditch digging, it, it really is a false dichotomy, right? We know that, in fact, more people who um, have high-quality post-high school credentials actually do better than the people without those post-high school credentials. In fact, if you look at income wages, if you look at um, overall life satisfaction factors, if you look at productivity in terms of your contributions back to society, 
the further up you go in terms of the education or credential chain, the more likely you are to be successful. Now, it's not linear. It's not true for everybody. But in general, uh, that's the case. And and what's, what's interesting is that um, this conversation about college has really been another one of these false dichotomies. It's been this view that you should go to a four-year college or you should go to something, you know, that I think people think is lesser. Uh, I think that's been the general view. And, the Ivy Tech stigma forever. That, that's right. Oh, and Elsperman's kicking that stigma right in the tail. Absolutely. And um, But, you know, what we know is that you can get a high-quality post-high school credential uh, at a community college. You can get a certificate. You can get an associate degree. Or you can get a bachelor's degree. You can get a bachelor's degree from a, a public institution. You can get one from a private institution. You can get one from elite school, a school that admits most of the students that it that it that um, uh, that apply to the school. And increasingly, you can learn outside of the traditional higher education system, which is really important, right? So workplace-based learning. Learning that takes place online through the internet in, in ways that are high quality. All of that we think is valid. So at Lumina, we talk about this idea that all learning counts. In other words, this notion that um, every place that you learn in work, in the military, uh, uh, in your community-based organization, at a college or university, all of that should count because all of that is going to drive your individual success and therefore our shared prosperity as a society. So we need to figure out how to create, this is the key issue, how to create pathways for people so that they don't just learn, stop, and then go do something. They learn over the course of their entire working lifetime. In other words, this, this idea that it's a continuous ongoing process and that what you should do is continue to learn and get recognized with a credential for, for doing that learning that's really important. You know, one of the... Um, Things that's been hardest to push back against because it, it, it really goes back to the idea that you said, which was in this post-World War II era, everyone heard the message, get a, get a bachelor's degree. So this idea that, well, you graduate from high school, you go to college, you get a bachelor's degree, and then you work the rest of your life and, and you are successful by, you know, by definition. That may have never been true, but it's more untrue now than it ever was before. In other words, this idea that you can first learn and then work for the rest of your life and be successful really is not true. It's that the nature of work, the nature of the way people live is changing too much for us to actually assume that it's this linear path of first you learn, then you work. It's an ongoing, continuous process. Criticize this statement. We have too many lawyers and not enough plumbers. I think um, I think we have um, uh, a, a misstated view of what both of those jobs really are in the modern era. Um, so I don't know that we have too many lawyers. We may have too many lawyers in certain categories in certain in, in certain ways. A lot of people who actually study law don't become lawyers. Uh, so that that you know that's probably um, a useful fact. And uh, again, um, yeah, we need plumbers, but the nature of plumbing has changed. And in fact, most plumbers really have to get quite a bit of training before they actually can uh, practice their trade and become very good at it. And that practice never changes. Why? Because the tools that they use change, the technology is changing. And so even if you're a plumber, you're going to need to continue to learn. And so again, it's another one of those sort of, of um, false dichotomies, those trade-offs that I don't think is real. I think um, the interesting question that is uh, we're exploring now is how will automation and artificial intelligence change lawyering and change plumbing? Those are interesting questions because I think in both cases, there will be changes to those jobs. Uh, my uh, view is that what we need to be talking about more is what are the tasks that people need to be really good at to be successful in work and in life? Because over the course of your lifetime, you're probably not going to just be a plumber or just be a lawyer. You're going to be a lot of different things because work is going to continue to evolve. You know, we see that now. My generation, so I'm, I'm, I'm around your age, Robert. Uh, my generation, um, a fairly large number of us could study one thing and work in a career in that area. So, you know, you go to school to be an accountant and you can be an accountant for the rest of your life. That's really not the case for the current generation. It is a much different environment because work is changing, where you work changes. Heck, a growing proportion of people, not only in the U.S., but around the world, work 
but they don't work in a job, right? They're working in, as independent contractors, as gig workers, et cetera. So, so it's a dynamic pl- uh, work, uh, work environment for people. And um, I think we need to prepare people for that dynamism. Well, that was actually one of the ways I was headed. I could go to trade school and become an electrician. Right. I could go to a four-year college and become an accountant. But where do I get the training to become an entrepreneur, right. to not just be a plumber, but own a plumbing company. And how does Lumina and or higher education in general do that job and do they do it well? You can't, don't think about just being an electrician. Why don't you become an electrical company and hire people and have a greater impact? Is there enough training in the entrepreneurial, for entrepreneurs in the entrepreneurial world? Absolutely not. I think that's that's a key issue. You know, uh, again, this is one of those things that both of these statements can be true. You know, one statement w- which we've long said at Lumina and that I've said throughout the course of my career working in this space is some learning is good, more learning is better, right? right? That, that, that's a truism, right? Because again, the changing nature of work and life uh, makes, that, makes that true. At the same time, what you need to know from a sort of broader sense, what we call generalizable knowledge, skills, and abilities, needs to be continued to be broader and deeper, whereas the specific content-oriented things, being a plumber, being an electrician, being a chemist, being a graphic designer, those things are probably going to be less important over time. In other words, your ability to be adaptable, to be nimble, will be really important. And entrepreneurship is a good example of that. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to envision that you can, quote unquote, train entrepreneurs. What you need to do is educate people in ways that you enhance their creative abilities, their abilities to be, um, um, you know, flexible, their abilities to be, uh, you know, to have those sort of skills that will allow them to not only create, but manage an organization. All of that doesn't necessarily mean that you need better lawyers, better accountants, better uh, better plumbers. It means that you've got to have broader knowledge and skills development over a longer period of time. And that's why this idea of learning on a sort of continuous basis is going to be increasingly important. One of the reasons we started the Leaders and Legends podcast, uh, besides, quite frankly, to give myself a chance to talk to people like you (laughs) and Mark Miles and Allison Malangdon and Medal of Honor recipient, Sammy Davis, the list goes on and on is in my reading of history that there is a, there's no substitute for leadership in so many things, whether it's, it's, it's tactical or strategic events or movements fail or succeed based on true leadership, inspiring, intelligent, sometimes a great personal sacrifice. What are some of the leadership examples that you've read about or witnessed or experienced firsthand that makes you go, you know, wow, that's really, that's not only selfless, but it's incredibly beneficial, maybe to a smaller audience or maybe to a larger audience. Yeah, it's hard not to, and I know this is probably a common uh, refrain among people you talk to, but it's hard not to point to your parents as leadership examples. Um, my dad, in particular, was an interesting example for me because, so my dad was a World War II veteran. He was um, actually shot down on a bombing raid in 1944 and held prisoner for 17 months. Uh, he was a high school dropout, um, was released in, in 1945, um, came back home, never finished his high school credential. Um, went out and worked in the world of work, but he was a smart guy who figured out how to navigate the world of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and, and, and into the 80s. No pun intended. Was uh, he a navigator in the plane? Uh, he was, he was actually, no, he was not. <laughs> he was, he was actually the, the low man. Uh, he was the uh, youngest guy doing the most dangerous job. He was the tail, tail gunner. gunner. Yeah. Uh, tail gunner and radio operator and a B-24 liberator. Oh, yeah. yeah. Those got absolutely pounded in World War II. Yeah. So I actually have my dad's war log, by the way. Really? His flight log? His flight log. And so he actually tells the story in there about the day that they got shot down. And unfortunately, they were on this bombing mission 
where most of the planes around them did not make it. Uh, they were one of the few that that made it. They uh, irate over Germany. The, the, yeah, the Germans knew they were coming, and they got just he he wa- he he explains in his war log watching the planes around them go down, and so they were fortunate they got hit and they were able to crash land the plane and survive. So, um, but I learned a lot from my dad, not only because that was a sort of signature, I wouldn't be here without that, that, that moment, but also because, um, my dad had this ability, he was a traveling salesman to sort of navigate his way through, through situations that was pretty extraordinary. He was also a really smart guy. He, um, my, my heritage is Greek. He, he could read and write in Greek, even though he was born in the U S and, and schooled in, in the U S. Uh, he continued uh, well past his retirement age to read newspapers in Greek as this really American guy. So, you know, he had this wide skill set um, that for my generation and for my children's generation, it's not possible to navigate the world with just that background, right? And did like, he come it, over? Did he come over? Did your he did not. My, my, my mother immigrated, uh, but my father did not. My, father, my father's uh, parents uh, came here. But uh, my father spoke Greek before he spoke English as as an immigrant, and so you know it's a just, there was so much um, classic American story. That's right. right. That's uh-huh. right. But there's so much um, conflict in the Ottoman Empire when it came to right Greeks, and you had this influx of people. That's why you have places named like Salandi, Michigan, right. which is named after a Greek patriot. Exactly. Did it give you a different sense of? How lucky you were to be in this country that, you know, you could be someplace else or, quite frankly, not be anyplace at all, given his military service. Absolutely. Um, It's also one of the reasons why I'm a strong advocate for smart immigration policy. I do think, back to your point about about entrepreneurialism, look, we, we need to continue to evolve American society to make us stronger, better, safer, a more a more uh, prosperous, democratic nation. Immigrants are a part of that story. Immigrants are disproportionately rec- uh, represented in, among entrepreneurs, among community leaders, et cetera. And so I really believe that when you think about talent and what talent can be applied to American success, we obviously have to develop most of that talent through our education system, through our, through our workplaces, et cetera. But the infusion of external talent is good for societies. It's good for America. And being smart and not irrational about uh, immigration strategies, I think is is important. And, you know, I don't think that should be a political issue, to be honest with you. I think we should be having a much more rational conversation than we are right now about immigration, because I think it enhances the talent that we already have here in ways that make us better and stronger. When anyone who studies the history, particularly of California in the 70s and 80s, you, you read about the tremendous impact that particularly Vietnamese immigrants had on the California economy right. who had fled Vietnam after, after the Vietnam War, after the United States had pulled out. Leaders and Legends were presented by Veteran Strategies Incorporated and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Crown Plaza and Union Station, Grand Hall and Conference Center, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Uh, you went to Bates College. Mm. Lewiston, Maine? Correct. Okay, so one of the most famous sporting events in all history happened in Lewiston, mm-hmm. Maine. Mm-hmm. The boxing event between... Uh, Sonny Liston Sonny and then Cassius Clay. Exactly. Uh, my Actually, my French teacher at college was from Lewiston, and I asked her about it, and she goes, damn it, does anyone know anything about my hometown other than that? <laughs> I said, we can't figure out why I was held there in the first place. Yeah. What was it like growing up? We're about the same age. Yeah. Uh, I always, in, in a podcast I did not that long ago with our uh, technical guru, Chris Spangle, we were talking about different generations. And those of us who grew up in the 80s, we're just happier. Right. We're good people. Right. We're friendly. We're fun. <laughs> uh, what was it like growing up in the 80s? Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, by the way, a quick story about that that fight. Uh, the um, the fight was called by Howard Cosell, and uh, the famous line from from that fight, which your younger listeners may not uh, even know who H- Howard Cosell is, but uh, is uh, because the fight ended so fast that the uh, Howard Cosell's quote is: "The students from Bates College are screaming, fix, fix <laughs> the Phantom uh, Bunch." <laughs> 
uh, with the <laughs> Phantom Punch, exactly. So, uh, so there was a lot of Bates students in the audience. You know, so I, as I mentioned, I, I grew up as a first-generation American, if you will, in an immigrant family. Um, I'm the first uh, generation to go to college. I'm the first to, to, to get a college degree. Uh, I grew up outside of Hartford, Connecticut, and um, actually hadn't been even on a um, on a visit to the campus before I showed up as a freshman at Bates. It just wasn't economically feasible for us to pay for the gas to drive to visit this school that was four hours away from where we lived. So I just showed up as a freshman, which seems insane in today's terms that you wouldn't even do that. Uh, of course, now you could do a virtual tour online and feel like feel like you've been there. But um, and um, I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have gone to a school that was so accepting of such a wide array of people um, and to have given me this grounding uh, in in life that's really important. One of my um, role models, uh, if you will, mentors uh, in life is a Bates College graduate that graduated uh, more than 60 years before I graduated, Benjamin Mays, Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was uh, Martin Luther King's mentor. And um, Benjamin Mays went on to become the president of Morehouse College and was the head of the Atlanta School Board when they desegregated the schools in Atlanta. But his um, autobiography is called Born to Rebel. Hmm. And uh, he was sort of a a pre-civil rights icon. He was civil rights before there was civil rights. And uh, he has this uh, great line in the book about Bates. He says, Bates didn't emancipate me. I emancipated myself. But Bates provided the far greater service of providing the context which supported my choice to be free. His point really was that when you learn, it gives you this wide palette of skills and knowledge and abilities that allow you to find your own path, to emancipate yourself, to actually create your own opportunities. And and I've tried to live those values over the course of my life to say, look, I don't deserve this. Nobody owes me anything. Um, I need to do the best that I possibly can and contribute because in a lot of ways I'm fortunate. You know, my parents didn't know what college was except for one thing that we were going, me and my brothers. And so, uh, you know, that, that, uh, opportunity has, uh, really propelled my entire career. Um, you know, I've been in the business of trying to get more people into and through not just college, as we were talking about at the beginning, but all types of learning opportunities because I think, it emancipated me in ways that I don't know what I would be doing right now, but I know because I've continued to try to learn and be a learner over the course of my life, um, I've benefited and hopefully I'm contributing a little bit to society and society's benefiting as well. I had an education client a few years ago and was sitting down with its CEO. And one of the things he said to me, he is not from here. He is from Florida. He said, Robert, you live in Indianapolis. You don't understand how much the education community is looking at your city and your state from around the country. He goes, because this is all you know is what's happening here. He goes, but you're being watched and you're being studied, meaning the city, meaning the state. You're here in Indianapolis. You've been here for a few years now. What do you think of your adopted hometown and what's happening in education in this city and state? You know, first, um, so I used to call myself a terminal East Coaster. I, n- I never thought I would live anywhere else. Uh, and uh, when the opportunity for Lumina came along, I was very enthusiastic and also uncertain. I didn't know much about Indiana or Indianapolis. Today, more than a decade later, I'm an unbelievable homer for Indianapolis <laughs> and for for Indiana uh, broadly. In fact, it frustrates me when my cocky East Coast friends sort of look down on the fact when I tell them that I'm, I'm really uh, enjoying Indianapolis. And they say, no, really, are, are, how is it? And I say, no, really, it's a wonderful place. And it's a wonderful place for a lot of reasons. We've all seen the New Yorker cartoon. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you, uh, the the ability to be in a place where there is this much education innovation going on is really interesting. So the mind trust, the the fact that you've got entities like Lumina Foundation here, the fact that you've had a series of governors who've all wanted to sort of advance learning opportunities at a statewide level, the fact that today you've got in this in the city of Indianapolis and in Central Indiana entities like the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership and the Chamber of Commerce. And lots of entities aiming at this entire 
continuum of learning opportunities, whether it be reform of K-12 schools or changes in how we educate adults through the Ascend Initiative at CICP or any of the other efforts that we could talk about. This is a place of real innovation and commitment to doing better for for our, our fellow Hoosiers and for this community. And to use a word you used a few minutes ago, I'm an unabashed school, I don't know if reform, what the current uh, in vogue term is. Yeah. Uh, no one says it better than Fred, Fred Klipsch. Right. Access to a quality education. More people, more families, more kids, more neighborhoods need access in the creation of quality education institutions, entities, and options. And IPS is one of my clients, and I think what Superintendent Johnson and her predecessor, Louis Farabee, and the board have done with that district is absolutely amazing. But you used a word a few minutes ago, talent. Yeah, There is such talent in this city and state at all levels of the education world, whether it's the philanthropic level, Fred Klipsch, Al Hubbard, Crystal DeHaan, or at the operational level, superintendents, or the organizational level, you mentioned the Mind Trust. Uh, there's so many more to talk about. How important is this multi level, multi generational, and quite frankly, multi racial cadre of talent? How important is that to the success of what's happening in the city and state? Yeah, it's extremely important. And I would add lots of others, right? Like the Central Indiana Community Foundation, Brian Payne, lots of lots of other leaders Jason Clove, in this exact Roush. Uh lots of, of, of people. You know, look, um, I think we need to do more and I think we need to do better. And that may be a line that you hear about a lot of different things, but it's really true when it comes to, to education. We've got to serve more people. And by more, uh, Lumina Foundation has been very clear that we've got to put our thumb on the scale of racial equity, that race does matter in modern society, and that we've got to do a better job for African-American and Latino populations than we've done in the past. But we've got to serve all Hoosiers, all members of our community, and we have to do so in a better way than we've done so far. In other words, that we should set the bar high for everyone. And that means that we shouldn't accept low-performing schools. We shouldn't accept good enough. We shouldn't accept this idea that, look, some people are, are you know, material for, for learning and some people aren't. We should assume that all people can learn and that all people should be given the greatest opportunities they can to develop their talent. I, I did a book a few years ago called America Needs Talent. And part of what I tried to say in the book is that talent is a combination of things. Sure, we all have some innate ability, but the point is that for all people, you can develop your abilities through education and experience in ways that not only impact you as an individual, but as all of us as a society. And we've got to actually develop and deploy that talent to make our community stronger, uh, our democracy uh, more more robust, and our economy stronger. And all of that is uh, critical uh, in terms of this this learning environment. It's fair to say that Lumina Foundation's mission is focused on higher education. Right. Is that a fair? Yeah, post high school learning, including higher education. Yeah. Given that, doesn't it make sense to also assert that Lumina may have one eye on higher education, but another eye on how kids are going to get there? Yeah, I would say we, we uh, maybe we're the three-eyed monster in a way because uh, we've we've got an eye on how they get there and and making sure that people are prepared for all of this learning that takes place after high school. And again, you and I talked about this. This is stuff that's taking place not just in the traditional four-year college environment, but lots of different contexts. So we need to get literally more people into the system. We need to do a better job of serving the people who are in the system. We have um, inadequate completion rates in college. Uh, we don't serve people uh, well. Um, you know, the success rates for students in college are much higher for white and Asian students than they are for African American, Latino, and Native American students. We, we should acknowledge that, not be afraid to talk about the race issues, but actually say, how do we do a better job so that everyone benefits? And the third I is we need to make sure that they are prepared for what comes after 
that learning experience, that they're prepared for work and for life, and that they continue to develop and hone their talent over the course of their entire lifetime. So it's getting into, it's getting through, and it's continuing the journey of learning that's really important for Lumina Foundation. That That's what we're really focused on. You're listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. We're here with Jamie Marisotis, who is the CEO of Lumina Foundation. Now, this speaking of being a homer, I'm about to go on a mini homer rant, <laughs> but it'll only take a few seconds, I promise. If it was up to me, everybody out of high school would have to serve their country in some form. AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, Marine Corps, doesn't matter. How much does public service factor into college success? I could never have graduated from college if I hadn't joined the Army first. Yeah. Not only could I have not have afforded it, but I just didn't have the mindset to succeed. Do you see any foundational springboards to success among people who wait a few years to go to college out of high school because they've chosen to do something else with their lives. Yeah, I feel very passionately about what you just said. Um, so first, let me say that um, I've been on the same journey you've been on for for much of, of, of my career. So um, actually, in the early 1990s, I was part of a group that helped to launch and, and create the Corporation for National Service, which includes AmeriCorps, as, as you, you mentioned. And so I've long believed in this idea that service is very important, again, both to you as an individual and to us as a society. Um, I just finished a new book that will come out next year um, called Human Work in the Age of Smart Machines. And part of what I'm positing in this new book is that we need to prepare people for human work, the work that only humans can do in this in this era of smart machines, of AI and automation. And part of that means that as humans, what distinguishes us from the machines is that we learn, we have a need to earn, and we um, serve others. And it is that combination of things, earning, learning, and serving, that really makes us different than the machines. That's what makes us human workers. And I think... National service, I think efforts to sort of expand opportunities, whether they're through government, whether they're through workplace based uh, partnerships, what have you are incredibly important. Um, I think developing and continuing to hone your service to other skills is, uh, is extremely important. Um, it is, it is core to who we are as humans, this, this desire to actually serve others. Uh, but again, it's like anything else. You have to develop that skill. You've got to develop that capacity. And you can do that in the military, as you said. You can do it working in a community-based organization. You can do it in a formal s structured process like AmeriCorps. But but being intentional about serving others, I think, is extremely important. Is I'm lucky enough to have received two college degrees. I'm even more lucky to be the father of a son who served two tours in Afghanistan. His contribution to this world and this country far outstrips my two college degrees. And I wonder how much we value military service and if we should value it more. And in Lumina's work in higher education, do you find that military service is a catalyst for success is something that makes a difference in lives, not only to the individual student, but also to the institution who wants good students, good leaders, people who succeed and are going to see it through. When I was starting my graduate work, my thesis director goes, I'm three years away from retirement. My graduate degree is in medieval history. So he's like, I got three years to retirement. I've had five or six people start with me and they never finish. He goes, why would I waste my time? How do I know you're going to finish? And I looked at him and I said, well, I was in the military. He looked at me and goes, sold. All right. How much of a difference does that make? Huge, hu huge difference. Um, you know, uh, we actually, uh, Lumina is a small but mighty team of people. We're 60 people, which is relatively small for a foundation of our size. But we have one full-time person that does nothing but military and veterans issues because we feel so strongly about the fact that you are learning and developing talent while you're in the military 
and you continue to do that as a veteran. Unfortunately, we know the the story, right? Which is that society doesn't fully value what you've learned in the military and what you can contribute as a veteran. And um, in particularly when it comes to traditional higher education, we have too many stories that we've heard over the course of too many years of people who have four or six or eight years or more of experience in the military and who show up as still relatively young people on our college campuses, and they say, welcome to freshman year. This makes no sense to us at Lumina, right? This <laughs> That's right. You, with all of the training, and again, it's both specific skills-oriented, but also the broader leadership training and all of the things that you get from the military. This idea that we don't adequately capture it and say, okay, you know this much, so we're going to treat you almost like a transfer student. We're going to recognize your prior learning, and we're going we're gonna to enhance what you got in the military so that you can do this, this, and this. Uh, that's a very important element of, of what we think our work can be. Uh, we, we are bringing other partners along with us on this journey. We think it's really important. Um, we actually have an interesting partnership right now with the American Legion. Uh, the mm-hmm. American Legion has, um, actually never, um, gotten, uh, taken a foundation grant before their partnership with Lumina Foundation. That's how important it is. Uh, both to the military and the veterans community in this country to actually develop new credentialing pathways, new ways of actually helping people with military experience transition into civilian life and actually um, ensure that they enhance what they learned in the military to help them uh, c- contribute to society and to their own well-being. And Marion University has a terrific new program where they're trying to recruit prior military to become teachers, that that's the leadership and that's the credibility. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but it's it's typical of, of Dan Helsner yeah. to be creative and think like, we need strong leaders in the classroom. Okay, where can we find strong leaders? How about the United States military? How about veterans? There is a presence. There is something about that that makes a difference when you are trying to convince someone to make the steps both my parents were in the Marine Corps. Yeah, My mother was the first female Marine Corps recruit in Indianapolis after World War II. Wow. And my father was from Camden. They met in the Marine Corps. And the one thing that I took from them, speaking of earlier, your comments about parents, was take responsibility. You're in charge. You can rise or fall based on what you do and trust the people around you who want the best for you. But in the end, it's up to you. Yeah. Is that a message that's transferable to higher education these days, or is it just too old-fashioned? No, I I think it is transferable. And you point out uh, the Marion University um, example, and and there are others around the country that we can point to. The problem is that we shouldn't be pointing to exemplars. We should be pointing to the system recognizing this. And, And I think that's why we've committed resources and energy to this. It's this idea that we shouldn't be pointing to these sort of special examples. We should be pointing to the entire system rowing in that direction and being able to recognize what you really get out of out of military service, and so yeah, I mean, I think uh, again uh, in the in the modern era, we've probably done a better job than we did maybe in the Vietnam era, for example, in recognizing the the uh, abilities of of uh, of people with with military experience, but we still have a long way to go. And I think higher education is a critical part of that. We want to make sure that higher education doesn't become a barrier to the success for those people because they want to contribute and we need to elevate them and give them those opportunities. And is barrier somewhat of a metaphor for student loan debt? Yeah. Student loan debt is, is certainly one uh, big factor, but so is the idea that, you know, again, that you um, aren't getting your prior learning recognized, which again will increase your student loan debt because you've got to go, go to college longer. A barrier is also that um, uh, people have learning needs in college that are different. They're variable. There's lots of reasons why people get into college but don't finish. And recognizing the unique circumstances of what someone coming out of the military and transitioning into higher education experiences is important. These people tend to be more mature. They are adults. They are they have a different experience set. And so the system needs to accommodate and recognize where they are in life not treat them the same as they might students who, who haven't had those, those experiences. Indiana is home to some pretty significant higher 
higher institutions of learning. Yeah. What's been your and or the foundation's uh, interaction and and spirit of cooperation with Mitch Daniels at Purdue or Michael McRobbie at IU, I mean, Notre Dame, Rose Home, and the list goes on and on. I mean, do even your East Coast friends like recognize we got some pretty amazing colleges here? Yeah, I think so. I, I will say that one of the things that we started to see, you know, my relationship with Mitch goes back to when he was governor, and um, he actually approached me about this idea of creating WGU Indiana. That was sort of his down payment, I think, on this idea of what he's now innovated with at, at Purdue. But the, all of the things going on at Purdue, the three-year degree and the the opportunities to do competency-based learning and all of the other things that, that uh, uh, Mitch has innovated, you know, what we see Ivy Tech trying to do in terms of cranking the wheel on aligning more workforce development with what the, uh, the workforce development system that Ivy Tech is a critical part of, with what the state actually needs, to what we're seeing at places like Butler with all the innovation that's happening now on the, the, the business school. The Butler School of Education is one of the best education schools in the country. You know, you've got uh, innovation happening up at Notre Dame, at, at uh, lots of different places in the state. Um, IUPUI, really interesting uh, model, collaborative model in the city of Indianapolis. We're, we're one of the only cities in the country that doesn't have a public institution that sort of bears the name of the city, right? Uh, it's a collaborative between IU and Purdue. That's interesting. So lots of innovation going on here. And, and I do think that there is recognition that um, Indiana is a part of that. And uh, we're happy, by the way, at Luna Foundation to be counted among those because we try to contribute to all of those efforts. We try to try to make a difference in all of them. How did you come to be headquartered here? So Lumina is a conversion foundation. Uh, it's a sort of complicated legal uh, term. Essentially, what it means is that we're the result of a corporate merger between a for-profit and a not-for-profit entity. So um, when Lumina was created, um, the um, company that was here was the nonprofit. It was called USA Group. And um, so they decided to locate the foundation here. In these conversions, what you do is essentially you... Uh, the for-profit buys the assets of the not-for-profit, and then a significant portion of that then gets cut off from the company and put into an independent private foundation. The sort of, of uh, legal reason for that is that you don't want the for-profit to have benefited from the fact that the not-for-profit never paid taxes all those years. So in order to do that, to sort of serve society's needs, you create a private foundation, and then you separate it from from the company. So uh, so Lumina was the result of the merger of Sally May and USA Group in the year 2000. Hmm. And overnight, uh, they created this this entity that uh, became wholly independent uh, immediately. And, and because USA Group was here, they located it here. And I'm glad they did. I, I think that if we were in San Francisco or Washington or New York, would be a different foundation. I think it's, I think it's a real asset for Lumina to be in Indianapolis. We talked about leadership a few <clears throat> minutes ago. To me, there is no more underrated figure in modern Indiana history than John Mutz. Hmm. What was his impact, not only in the world of education, but the world of philanthropy? Yeah, so John is really a Renaissance man. So I, I still see John regularly. Um, he's 83 years old now. Uh, he's been on your podcast. He's a, he's a, an incredibly uh, unique guy. And I think he has been one of the key influencers of the last century of, of Indiana's history. Um, he was one of a very small number of people that created Unigov for Indianapolis. Um, he's one of a very small number of people who recognize the value of foreign investment in Indiana uh, and uh, sort of um, helped to bring a sort of different vibe to the manufacturing sector at a critical time. He's a very successful leader of a private company in PSI Energy. And, you know, the work that he did at the Lilly Endowment, though he was he was only there a fairly short period of time, um, I think served him very well in terms of his ability to lead Luna Foundation in its early years as chair to lead the board of Luna Foundation and help to shape uh, what it is. We, we really are an unusual entity in philanthropy. We're unusual for, for a lot of reasons. Um, the fact that we're focused on a single issue, the fact that we have a 
time-limited quantitative goal, this 60% of Americans should have a high-quality degree certificate or other credential by 2025 goal, the fact that uh, we are an organization that um, has a, a um, really strong public policy presence. So lots of things um, that all go back to John Mutz's vision for what this organi- organization could could achieve. And, and uh, he and I were just talking about this last week, that um, – the long-term success of Lumina, we are convinced, is baked in now uh, because uh, the decisions that were made in 2000 have been borne out today. In other words, that you can create this entity, focus on this single issue, aim it towards trying to be a catalyst for large-scale, large-scale system change, not just focused on sort of doing charity, but actually being a leadership organization that can be very ambitious on behalf of society. All of that is because of John's vision, in my opinion. Not to mention he authored the legislation that basically created IPUI. Exactly. I'm 34 years old. I'm a single mom. I have two kids. I don't really like my career. I want to do something else. It's not too young, not too old. Got plenty of life experiences, but I have a willingness and a drive to learn and to better my life. How can Lumina help me? You know, so Lumina doesn't serve individuals. We, right. we you know, we provide a service on behalf of a broader sen- uh, set of entities, although we do provide access, if you go to our website, luminafoundation.org, um, to lots of our partners and organizations that, that do that kind of work. The key message that we try to um, explain to that 34-year-old mother you, that you're talking about is that Learning is for you. Uh, one of the hard things um, in dealing with adults who've never had prior learning experience is that they think that it's a window that they missed and they can't get it back. Um, and it is for you. And there's the key is to get on that first rung of, of the ladder of opportunity. And in order to do that, you got to go to Ivy Tech. You got to find your way into a learning opportunity online. You've got to sort of get yourself going because what you'll see is that the more you learn, the more you get rewarded. And it's like a ratcheting process and you, and you will ratchet up over time. But that message for, for Lumina to, to that very large population of people. I mean, what you're talking about, by the way, that, that person represents more than 60 million Americans, 60 million Americans who have no, who are adults and who have no experience in the post high school learning system at all. Um, given what we know the rewards are of learning after high school in terms of wages, quality of life, all the things I mentioned earlier, um, we've got to get a lot more of those people into and through all kinds of different learning opportunities. Start at work. Start it at, uh, uh, you know, join the military. You know, do do things that, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I are friends with with a, a couple. He joined the military in his late 30s mm. um, and got a lot of experience and sort of changed the trajectory of his life. And now as a 50-year-old, he's doing really well. And, and um, so, um, but creating the opportunity for yourself by developing your talent is really important. That's the message we want to deliver. If Lumina or Jamie could wave a magic wand and solve one particular problem as it relates to higher education, which one problem would you choose to solve? Yeah, you know, I I think the um, the biggest problem that we have right now is the the growing disparity the challenges of of inequity by race that we see uh, in in our country and um if we don't solve the racial equity challenge i think that we are going to face a sort of multi-generational problem of this sort of of reproduction of lack of opportunity so um, equity is is really the sort of foundation of all that Lumina does. It plays out in different ways, right? It plays out in the work that we're doing on financing, on learning credentials, on work that we're doing in communities, work that we're doing in public policy. But um, unfortunately, we live in a society where, um, and you know, Central Indiana Community Foundation has made this point uh, really well that racial inequity is something that we've got to talk about and act upon, and find ways in which we can help everyone understand that. This is not about us and them. This is about us. This is about our collective well-being. And Brian Payne, who's the president and one of the 
true living legends of Indiana. Talked yeah. about that on our podcast with him. So did Brandon Brown, the yeah. CEO of the Mind Trust, when we talked about it with him. Is one of the problems of the persistent existence of racial inequality in X, the fact that most people believe that the problem has been solved. Yeah, I think that is one issue, is that there's a lack of understanding that, in fact, it it hasn't been solved, uh, or that it has been solved, and therefore we should move on to other things. And my view is that it has not been solved. Uh, but another, I think, is that it's hard. It's it's an uncomfortable conversation for lots of different people. And so it's, it's really challenging to sort of confront race, co- to confront bias, to recognize it and say, okay, let's get over our discomfort and let's figure out a way to deal with this in a way that um, that makes sure that everyone benefits. Um, I also think that um, it's complicated. Um, it is not an easy issue that we are dealing with uh, prior experiences. We are dealing with contemporary, you know, um, uh, current uh, elements of racism. We're dealing with issues related to um, lack of knowledge, uh, lack of experience with other cultural and racial groups that we've got to figure out how, how we address. And so I'm certainly not going to sit here and argue that the government can solve all of these issues. That That's not my point. My point is that at a societal level, whether it be um, uh, with employers, through the military, maybe through government strategies, maybe through uh, other efforts, that together we should be addressing this in a holistic, systemic way, not assume somebody else is going to solve this. You know, somebody said to me uh, last year that, well, fundamentally, isn't that a a failure of the education system? And my answer was yes, and. (laughs) It's a failure of the education system, but it's also a failure of lots of different elements of society. So let's improve how the education system can serve racial equity better, but let's find ways in which we can deal with these issues in a much more holistic way as a society. Maybe education reform movement is an antediluvian term and they don't use it anymore. And maybe they want to come up with something different, but is the school reform movement, innovation network schools, vouchers, perhaps charter schools, more option In your view, is that a step in the right direction, given that the overwhelming number of charter schools are located in the urban core and a significant percentage of vouchers are used by uh, disproportionately used by minorities? Are these steps to move the ball forward or is it just not enough at the time? Yeah. So look again, sort of go back to the old line. Some learning is good, more learning is better, right? And so in order to do that, we've got to innovate throughout the system. So I'm in favor of everything you just said. My point is that the current system hasn't adequately served our society well, and we need innovation to serve more people better. So I'm for all of those options that you talked about. And by the way, I I want to make sure that this is a point that your listeners understand. Many of the same issues that we deal with in the urban core are issues we deal with in rural communities that in fact there's more in common between the rural and the urban than I think we're willing to recognize. So, so this is, you know, again, we sort of have this view that there is one set of issues in, in one geography and another in a, in a different geography, but issues of, of, of substance abuse, of, of family issues, you know, all the contextual issues, poverty, et cetera. Access they, to jobs, yeah, they, job training. Exactly. They, they cut across these traditional notions of, of, of geography. And so, so I think it's going to be important for us to recognize that we do have to innovate. We do need to do a better job. And we also have to be honest about what works and what doesn't. It doesn't mean that the innovations are necessarily better than what we do now. We should be trying to change the current system, and develop more innovations so that over time, uh, all of the options that are available serve people better than, than the system does now. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran business enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza Union Station Grand Hall and Conference Center, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We are here with Jamie Marisotis, president and CEO, Lumina Foundation. 
we've reached the point where you get to compare yourself with other leaders. Uh oh. We end all podcasts with the five questions, which your amazing uh, teammate, Tracy, pr- tried to pry out of me. No, no, no. <laughs> but I promise that they're easy. So, question number one What was your first job? So my, it depends on how you look at this, Robert. So my, my first job b- before I got out of college was, you know, I had a paper route when I was 10 years old. And so, uh, you know, I've been working since I was 10 years old and I, I've, I've, I've never stopped. Um, I actually had three jobs in high school. I had three jobs in college. My first job after college was as a research analyst for the college board, studying the same issues you and I are talking about today, um, student success, college access, uh, making sure that more people can benefit from the learning system. What was your first concert? Oh, that's a painful one because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a product of the, I'm, I'm born in the uh, 1964, so I'm a product of the 70s. And um, so my first concert was Kiss, 1977. After Kiss uh, Alive? Uh, yes, exactly. Was that the concert that... Uh, uh, Judas uh, Priest Seeker. was their opening act. Judas Priest? Yes, was their opening act. Yeah, isn't that unbelievable? So, yeah, I was a uh, a heavy metal Southern rock guy for a while. And then, you know, my, my musical uh-huh. taste evolved over time. I became an, an 80s music REM kind of guy by the time I got to college. But at that point, I, yeah, that was my that was my thing. So oh, Priest is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> if you could recommend any book for someone to read... Which book would you recommend? So I read a lot, um, and um, and I don't always read things that are just out. Um, and I read a book recently that is not a book that showed up on a lot of radar screens, but I would recommend to your listeners because it's a really important uh, story to tell right now. It's called The South Side, A Portrait of Chicago and American Segregation by Natalie Moore. So um, she's actually a reporter, um, a local reporter in Chicago. And what she does is tell the stories of people and policies that are continuing to perpetuate this issue of segregation on the South side of Chicago. It's sort of a memoir in a way about her own family experience, but these powerful stories of people who the system just keeps holding them back and what we should learn about their personal stories. So great book, uh, the South side, Natalie Moore, I, I highly recommend it. So many of the books that are recommended by our the people participating in the podcast, I guess it should come as no surprise, right? Cause we're sitting here in Indianapolis, but they focus on urban issues, Yeah, either histories of cities or issues facing cities currently. If you could witness any event in history, be there as it happens, which event would you choose? This is a really hard question, right? And I'm, I'm sure over time you've gotten people answering, you know, the birth of Christ or, uh, you know, important uh, events. Um, this is probably one that you haven't gotten before, or may- maybe you have because you've talked with people like like Jim Morris. But um, mine is actually an event that took place a week before I was born, um, April 20th, 1964. Um, and it was the closing speech that Nelson Mandela gave at his trial before he was put in prison mm. for 27 years. Um, and so you got to put yourself in the context of the time. So Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech was uh, less than a year before this, right? I'm sure some people said Martin Luther King's speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I've, uh, I, I worked in, in South Africa as a consultant for, for several years and got to know South Africa pretty well and read a lot about uh, the history and contemporary life. And anyway, this he, he ends his three-hour closing speech in his own trial— where he gets convic- huh. convicted and sent mm-hmm. to, to life in prison with this uh, statement that I'll just quickly um, read to you. I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all people will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal for which I hope to live for and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it's an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Um, so Nelson Mandela sort of, I think, was the most important person of the 20th century. Um, He lived a life of purpose that I think is an extraordinary model. Interestingly, when he was released uh, from prison 27 years later in 1990, and then four years later was elected president of South Africa, 
uh, the first thing that he said when he came out of prison, when he talked to reporters, was he repeated the last line. line. He said, uh, "This it's an ideal for which I am prepared to die. So he fundamentally did not change his view in 27 years in prison, which is pretty pretty extraordinary thing. And I, I think it says a lot about our world today that um, we need to think about what we really want to stand for, what we believe in. And uh, I'm not sure that... Um, Everyone wants to commit to dying in order for, you know, for their for their principles, but the point is that that moment in history is one that I wish wish I could have witnessed. Your father committed mm. to that principle. Absolutely, absolutely. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, living today, whom would you choose? Kevin Corcoran is not an option. Yeah, he's uh, been named by too many people. I, I, I and I, I already have had dinner with him. So I, <laughs> I, I can, you can check that one off, uh, off the list. Uh, again, this might be one that you got before, but it would be really interesting. Can I cheat a little bit and say Barack and Michelle Obama? It would be really sure. interesting to have dinner with the two of them. Um, not to talk about right now and sort of their views about what's going on in the world since since he left office. But I would love to spend a dinner talking about his own journey of, you know, being this this uh, kid with this complex personal background and somehow making it all the way to the presidency of the United States. It's a really unusual story, even if you're not a Democrat, even if even if you're not sort of, of someone who who supported what he did. His life journey is extraordinary, and I would love to spend time talking with him and talking with her, who she, Michelle Obama had a different life journey, the fact that they came together and sort of ended up in this a unique moment as, um, you know, um, historic uh, models for us as, as Americans, I think is really interesting. I'd, I'd love to talk with them about that. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. Uh, we appreciate your time. We know you have so much going on, but a focus on education and kind of um, the 19th century Victorian notion of improvement is a big part of what the leaders and legends podcast wants to discuss. We are here with Jamie Marisotis, who is the president and CEO of Lumina foundation. And even if you don't feel it's work because of what you do or what you have done, I promise you, the work of the foundation is being felt, and that is a good thing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank, delighted to be with you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.